a product of working between the museum and the, the uh, North Carolina Office of Environmental Education and Public Affairs. And we're so excited to have Dr. Ashley Emanuel here today with us. She's going to talk to us about being an um, aquatic mobile vet veterinarian, um, which sounds amazing to me. We've been chatting and I've learned a few fun things. Her very first patient was a fish at a public library in Boone, and she did surgery in front of children. So there's going to be some really great things to learn about in here some fun stories. Um, and so I'm excited to learn more. So welcome everyone. And welcome Ashley to our lecture today. Why don't you take it away and start telling us about your awesome adventures? You got it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Um, let me just go ahead and pull this up and we will get started. Okay. Um, so this is lovingly called Pipe Dreams. <laughs> uh, this is my life as a mobile aquatic veterinarian and how I got here and what in the world I do. So um, if you have any questions or anything, please don't hesitate. I love to talk about what I do. So, so this is just an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I really can't stand talking about myself. I think my patients are much more interesting than I am. <laughs> so we're going to start talking a little bit about how I in the world became an aquatics veterinarian, like why, uh, and then some pros and cons of mobile fish work, just mobile vet work in general, I think is a blast. And we'll talk about that. Um, and then someone very special to me told me that, um, passion for what you do is what people remember. So that's where it's really going to come in. We're going to talk about a few of my favorite cases, um, just some of my favorite patients, really fun, weird stuff that I think will give you a better idea of what I do than really anything else. So uh, we'll end with any questions you guys might have, and I'm happy to hang out beyond lunch. But thank you very much for sharing your lunchtime with me. Um, I know that that's valuable time for everybody. Speaking of lunch, I did want to give a couple of heads ups that I, um, I am a veterinarian and I have lots of gross stories. And so we do talk a little bit in this talk about um, mucus, parasites, there's some eyeballs um, in one video, just because I'm really bad at taking videos through my microscope, it like flashes a little bit and I'll give you guys a heads up when that comes, if that gives you a headache. Um, also, I'm at home right now and my cat generally leaves me alone unless I need to be on Zoom. So she'll probably come and visit at some point and my dog may yell at me through the door. So apologies in advance for all of that. I hope you're having like a number five oyster toad fish day today and feeling really good about things. But <laughs> and by the end of it, we're all going to be nines. We're all going to be happy and super psyched about about fish medicine. I like to start my talks out with a little bit about my credentials. Um, in veterinary school, one of our professors always used to start her talks like this. And the thought was, uh, what right do I have to be here talking to you? <laughs> uh, so I like to explain a little bit about like where in the world I came from. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, and then I went to Roger Williams University in Bristol, Rhode Island, where I got a BS in marine biology. Prior to going to college, I raised a California mudflat octopus, which is the picture that you see there, in my high school biology classroom because I had maxed out all of my high school science credits and just needed more. So I got an independent study and raised an octopus, and it was just game over from there. That's, that was destiny. Um, while I was in college, I did research for three and a half years on the common cuttlefish, which is sepia officinalis. That's a very fancy male that's showing off right there. So he's obviously there's a lady somewhere. Um, but I hatched little tiny babies out of eggs and just fed them and basically spent every break at college trying to take care of these guys. And it was just the most fulfilling thing ever. I learned really quickly that I'm terrible at research and that probably a career as like a PhD or something was not for me. Um, but when a couple of my animals got sick, it sparked something in my brain, just providing health care for these unusual animals. And I was like, oh, OK, there it is. My path started to kind of slowly narrow itself down. So thank you to my cuttlefish for helping me figure that out. Um, once I decided I wanted to go to vet school, I started volunteering at the Roger Williams Park Zoo in Providence, Rhode Island. That's a sake monkey. And it was the first patient I ever saw get anesthetized. And it was so overwhelming to me that I almost passed out. <laughs> so I had a second where I was like, maybe I shouldn't be a veterinarian, but it turns out I just shouldn't be a vet for monkeys because fish don't do the same thing to me. Um, after I graduated, I moved down to North Carolina and people familiar with the museum should recognize at least the picture on the right <laughs> that is on the first floor of the older wing of the museum. And I did do my due diligence and pay my dues by crawling into small spaces and plumbing and scrubbing out disgusting tanks while that diamondback terrapin tried to bite me every single time. I think that terrapin's probably still there being hateful. Um, but I did that for a couple of years. And then I was just telling Melissa too that I actually found out in the stairwell of the museum. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Hang on. 
Now you guys get to see that. There we go. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, I found out in the stairwell of the museum that I was going to vet school. So um, my history with the museum goes way back and definitely has a really special place in my heart. But I did eventually go to vet school um, at NC State. At graduation, the vet students are always the really obvious ones because we blow up palpation sleeves and use them as thunder sticks and just generally kind of act up. Um, so <laughs> did eventually get my veterinary degree. And then I worked for five years at an exotics exclusive, really busy practice where I became the first certified aquatic vet in North Carolina. Um, at the time that I got that certification, there was about 75 or 80 of us in the world. And I think now we're pushing up into like one 30 or something like that. So it's great. There's um, more and more vets getting interested in fish. I had a really good time. Um, we're not talking about any of these cases today, so no giveaways, but that is Misty um, in the library, my very first patient when I opened Oak City Aquatics. <laughs> so after five years in a really busy clinic, I just decided, you know, and I think it's time to finally act on this dream and opened Oak City Aquatics. So um, Oak City Aquatics is coming up on their, on their third birthday, second birthday, second birthday in June. And it's just been the most fun. So enough about me. Let's get cracking. Let's start talking about what it's actually like being a fish veterinarian. Um, people are surprised that even I exist. And they're even more surprised when I tell them that there's like more of us. <laughs> and we do all kinds of crazy things, not just mobile fish work like I do. So I fall into the category of doing pet fish work. Um, but there's also food and bait fish veterinarians. There's lab animal veterinarians who primarily are focused on zebra fish, but do work with other animals. Um, and then there's natural resources and hatchery veterinarians. We're all over the country. We're all over the world. Um, right now, there's no actual board. So if you hear like a boarded veterinarian. We don't have a true board. The certification that I have is the highest thing that we can get for right now, but a board is actually in the works and it's looking like in the next year or two, there will be boarded fish vets. It's going to be amazing. I'm really excited. <laughs> um, we're seeing an increased frequency with exotics and fish medicine exposure to veterinary students in schools, which is amazing because Obviously, there's a huge personal bias here, but I think that they're really important, um, but it's still lacking. And so having more vets out there who are willing to kind of talk about this and have students extern and just contact people, the better. So um, I'm an open book when it comes to talking about my work. Um, my email is all the way on the end, as is my website. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, my primary field of work, like I said, is pet fish. So primarily koi ponds and hobby aquarists. And we do have koi ponds all over the state here. I do um, answer some questions every once in a while for a few of our hatcheries that are primarily out in the Western part, but they have um, other people that they work with. So it's okay. I'll stick with my koi. So the ins and outs of mobile fish practice. I thought that maybe it would be easier just to um, show you guys. And I'm hoping that this plays. It does. So I just love being outside. Um, I joke that I'm basically a plant with feelings. So I like being in the sun. I like having dirt. Um, you know, I just really have a great time. And I have some really wonderful clients that let me film silly little videos that demonstrate kind of what I do. So this is one of my favorite clients. Um, this fish is getting sleepy. It's not getting euthanized. It's getting sleepy. But we have to sedate them in order to do some exams. And this is the flash warning. I'm sorry. It's already happening. But um, two different kinds of external parasites kind of gives you the heaps. But <laughs> these fish presented as just being kind of itchy and flashing and acting kind of dumpy. Um, but this is just <laughs> a good overview of what my work kind of looks like in a, in a nutshell. And then I get to go home. Um, and get some more sunshine on my face, but we'll talk a little bit more about it. I I am a huge champion of mobile practice, not just for fish. Um, I mean, I think definitely for fish, <laughs> but I think for a lot of other patients too. For my patients, particularly seeing the fish in their home environment is huge. Um, fish live in a toilet bowl, if you think about it. You know, even with the best filtration, they live in a place where they eat and go to the bathroom and there's parasites and there's other fish. And if they're outside, there's like birds. And I had one fish that got attacked by either a bobcat or a bear. We never really figured it out. But getting to see where they live is so important for these guys. And getting to return them to their own home environment has a huge impact on their recovery outcomes. So I will literally do surgery right next to the pond and then recover the fish in the pond. And they do so much better. Um, and I really love this video of Ginkgo. She had a procedure on her eye and she was recovering from sedation. And you could see her buddies over in the corner, like waiting for her as she was recovering. And it was so sweet. Like she just swam right off when we were done and she had a great time. But that's a great example that these guys... Um, 
um, I think have more emotional intelligence than we give them. And they are aware when they're alone and they're aware when like a fish disappears. And so having them be able to go back to their buddies is a really big deal for them. Um, I can reduce reinfection because I can treat the whole pond. So if somebody would bring them, just bring me just one fish in the clinic, I can treat just that one fish, but I'm going to put it back in this dirty pond and it's going to get sick again. So I can treat everybody. Everybody's not stressed, including the owners, because nobody has to like literally put a fish in a wheelbarrow and put it in the back of their truck, which definitely happened to me. <laughs> like, you know, people are kind of overwhelmed about how do I get this fish in you? Um, but for me beyond that, it's also offered a lot in the way of my own personal mental health and my flexibility. Um, I'm a single mom of three kids. And so having flexibility is a really big deal to me. And I think this being Women's History Month, it's valid to point out that veterinary medicine is a female dominated profession that is run by older men. And so it is becoming much more family friendly and much more flexible and much more supportive of like mental health needs, which is great, but we have a long way to go as veterinarians and the ability to make my own schedule and own my own practice has really been a game changer, not just for me, but for my kids. So I'm just endlessly grateful for that. And the fact that I get to see the sun, like you know, pulling a 12 hour shift in the hospital. And you're like, I literally have no idea what the weather is today. I haven't even seen a window, <laughs> you know, it's just much better. Um, from a financial standpoint, it was much easier to start into ownership by owning a mobile practice because I got everything for my practice for less than $8,000 and I was on the road. And that's pretty huge when you think about most veterinary practices are multi-million dollar ventures. So it was pretty cool that I could get started with that little and was making money in a month or two, which they tell uh, people who are opening new practices to anticipate you're not going to pay yourself for over a year. So the fact that within a couple months I was paying myself is pretty great. And also, I just really love my patients and I love that I get to spend time with them. I can make my own schedule and I anticipate that my fish appointments are two to three hours. And I let my clients know that because I like to be there for all of it and I won't leave a sleepy patient and I won't leave until all the questions are answered. And I can do that on my own time, which is just the best. You know, I really love it. The low overhead thing is pretty interesting. The equipment, particularly for fish, is really easy to source, inexpensive to acquire, and isn't single use. So like my favorite bucket is from Lowe's and I do have a favorite bucket. <laughs> and, like it is labeled like my bucket. So nobody puts anything in it. Like my kids don't put chalk or dirt or anything in it. Um, but a lot of my practice came from pet stores, Amazon and hardware stores. Um, so I use things like buckets, air stones, plastic bags. You'll see my favorite piece of bubble wrap in a picture at some point. And you, yeah, literally bubble wrap is amazing for surgery on fish. <laughs> um, that's, I hope it's coming across already, but I really love my work. And I love that I can kind of work a little bit of the magic of medicine in a low tech way. It just really feels good to me. Um, I got my microscope on Amazon and I use a fetal Doppler to monitor heart rate when I have surgical patients. So um, some of the things I got from veterinary suppliers were stuff like surgical equipment and drugs and, and ultrasound and things like that. But the vast majority of it, I just put in a cart on Amazon. <laughs> um, and then I do, there are some aquaculture supply companies to so things like I have just so many nets. It's ridiculous how many nets I have. I look like a crazy person when I come home from an appointment and I have them all disinfecting and they're all strung all over my fence and it just it looks nuts. But um, you do have to get some stuff from actual like fancy companies. There are some cons. I'm I'm definitely um, a relentless optimist, but there's always cons to any kind of work. It's lots of driving. Um, I have a few podcasts that I really love and that makes the time go faster. But again, as a single mom, sometimes like being alone and being quiet <laughs> is kind of nice. So it's not the end of the world. Um, but as a mobile veterinarian, I don't have access to higher tier diagnostics. So one of these later cases we're going to talk about using a CT on a fish. Um, I'm really fortunate that I can interact with local clinics that are really supportive of what I do. And I can buzz in there and use their x-ray or use their CT or something if I need to. And mostly it's like the cool factor. Like if I call them and I'm like, I have a fish, I'd like to do a CT. I'll take care of everything. <laughs> can I just like borrow your CT and pay you for it? And most of the time they're fine with it. Um, there are mobile veterinarians who are starting to integrate mobile x-ray into their practice. It's just with this being kind of a baby practice, I'm not quite there yet. So a couple of years, hopefully we'll have some x-rays. <laughs> and then, you know, people become veterinarians because they love animals and they always forget that animals are always attached to people when you're a veterinarian. And so I do get my fair share of people who literally tell me that I'm a waste of my education. They have no under like no 
concept of why somebody would bring their fish to me or why they would call me. Um, they don't need me, stuff like that. And that, you know, it gets old after a little while, but I usually tell them, Hey, I'm not knocking down your front door telling you, you have to call me. So if you don't want to call me, don't call me. Like, you know, it's not the end of the world. I do like to talk a little bit about the aquarium hobby and veterinarians because they definitely think that vets are the bad guys for a lot of it. Um, we're, we're making strides for sure. But um, the perception of vets is that we don't have any education. We don't have any experience with fish, which is true for a lot of vets. It's fair. Um, and then the other thing that I hear a lot from people is that they just assume that their vet wouldn't be willing to learn or wouldn't be willing to help. Um, I try to create a really like collaborative relationship with my clients because I want them to understand that like my job is to get the medical part of this down, the diagnostics, the medication, all of that stuff. Your job is to know about the husbandry, the natural life cycle, the needs of your fish, because I can't know all of that. And I will never pretend that I do. Um, but for the vets that are out there that like to pretend that they do, I can see how that would be a strain on the relationship, um, not considering a hobbyist experience. There's the expense. I hear that all the time. I got this fish at the fair. Why would I call a vet? And again, I'm like, you don't have to. But for some people, that's their pet, right? Like one of my favorite cases we're not talking about today was a little beta fish named Blue who ended up getting diagnosed with melanoma in the clinic. And the family came into me and said, listen, our kid is really allergic to dogs, cats, everything else. This is our golden retriever. So we will treat him like our golden retriever. And I was like, oh my God, okay. <laughs> you know, like it was so sweet. Um, but those are the clients that I do what I do for. Um, the people who see the value of what I do and want to have that relationship with their vet. And if you don't, that's okay. Um, I've only got accused of being paid off by big fish food once. And I laughed really hard um, because it's so not a thing. <laughs> it is so not a thing. <laughs> I promise. No fish vet is like sponsored by Hikari or anything. It, it would be fine. Um, this is kind of, I reached out to a group that I'm in and just said, how could a veterinarian help you? Um, that had some good answers, but the overwhelming one was that somebody asked me just for my prescription pad. And I was like, oh, Okay, I'm not going to do that. But <laughs> so all the blue ones are good. You know, people are like, oh, my God, I'm so excited that a vet would even see my fish. And then there's the people who are like, just write me scripts. Um, so that's kind of enough about me, I think. <laughs> um, but let's talk about a few of my favorite patients, I think. Yeah, we're doing good. We have time. This is the fun part. Um, this is the first of the bad fish jokes. I think there actually is a, a fish called a pudding fish. That's what it is. It's a pudding white for us. So the proof is in the pudding fish. They're really pretty. Our first case um, is going to be, this is big words, uh, but basically swim bladder disease in a goldfish using a CT, which is really fun. Um, people are a little bit amazed by what we can do with some diagnostics. And I think this is a good example of some of the interesting stuff we can do. Uh, so this three-year-old fish was a male comet goldfish, just like your generic feeder goldfish. Somebody got it figuring it was going to be small. And then it did the goldfish thing and it gets gigantic. And then they're like, well, this goldfish is going to live forever. What am I going to do now? <laughs> um, his name was Big O. He was about eight inches. So he's a pretty big comet. Um, they were keeping him in a 40 gallon, which is way, way too small for a fish of his size, let alone with four other fish. So we were living in a really stressful, really dirty environment. Um, there wasn't really a monitoring of any water quality or anything, but he was a really gregarious fish and they loved him enough to bring him in and see if there was anything they could do. Um, they came in saying that he was negatively buoyant, meaning that he couldn't get off the bottom of the tank. Uh, he just was kind of like scooting around on his belly and not really getting much lift. Um, they noticed that when he was resting, he was doing this boat listening thing. So he would kind of like rock side to side like this, <laughs> um, but he couldn't really get off the ground. He was lethargic and he hadn't eaten for about two weeks, which if this was your dog or cat that they would be absolutely having a heart attack if their animal hadn't eaten in two weeks. In my case, it's like not great but they'll be okay. We can come back from that. It'll be all right. Um, again, water quality wasn't monitored. So think about going back to this environmental concern, right? We have to worry. It's like air quality for us. You know, if our air quality is bad, then we're going to get sick. If their water quality is bad. They're definitely going to get sick. They hadn't additionally added any new um, fish or anything. They hadn't put them in a pond. And amazingly, I say amazingly, these owners hadn't tried anything yet because the vast majority of my patients come in and these owners have these huge bags of stuff that they just went to the pet store and just were like with the shelf and dumped everything in and they dump all this stuff in. And now I'm battling back from that in addition to what was actually making their pet sick. So these guys were already on my good list because they hadn't dumped anything in their tank yet and they were willing to see what I had to say.
when I was checking him out, he was doing something that's called clamped fins. So think about like this fish that you see here, right? The fins are extended. They look nice and normal. They're not tattered. We're using them for mobility and stability. This fish was holding his fins like just flat up against his body, which is part of the reason probably why he was listing. He couldn't really balance himself. I did notice the buoyancy abnormalities. Um, I like to call it a therapeutic visit to the veterinarian because it's like a general rule that any animal stops presenting with the symptoms you're taking them in as soon as they see the vet clinic or as soon as they smell the vet. <laughs> and so the fact that he was actually demonstrating this behavior was um, good. I actually got to see it. And I tried putting a little food in there and he couldn't even get himself off the bottom. Like there was interest, there was an appetite, but he couldn't even get himself to the food. Um, he did have a slightly distended belly. It was a pretty subtle thing, but we could see it. And then when I looked at him, he didn't have any signs of like a massive bacterial infection. He wasn't itchy. Fish can absolutely be itchy. <laughs> he wasn't itchy. He wasn't struggling. He wasn't breathing hard. He just was like, ugh, you know, I can't get off the bottom. So I ended up doing an ultrasound on him. Um, this isn't actually a big O, this is a koi, but this is a demonstration of how we can ultrasound fish. The great thing is that fish come with their own ultrasound gel. So we don't usually have to put much on there because they're slimy creatures. Uh, so this guy does have a little bit of extra on there, but um, MS-222 is the anesthetic that I use. A lot of people ask me that question. Um, there's a lot of hobbyist groups that use things like clove oil um, because it's available over the counter to kind of to the general public. I never advise that because it's really difficult to control and really easy to either get them too deep or too light. So this kid did get anesthetized using like the fancy schmancy veterinary drug. And then I just basically, this is all big words for the fact that I couldn't see anything. <laughs> it was just like a mess inside its belly. It just, nothing was jumping out. There wasn't a big bright rock in there or anything like that. It just was like a mess. Fish tend to be like that. They have a lot of fibrin in their bellies anyway. They're just really inflammatory creatures. They just get really red and really edematous and yucky. And so I, I couldn't tell them anything except like what we lovingly say, SBI, which means something bad inside. Um, and that literally taught us that in veterinary school, SBI, something bad inside. Um, so that's basically what I had to come back to them and say, like, there's something really yucky going on here, but I can't really give you a good answer. We're looking at exploratory surgery. We're looking at future diagnostics or we're going to discuss quality of life here for this kid. Um, so my big things that I were worried about was that he had a mass on his kidneys. Um, was this actually a female? And did she have a big ovary that was being abnormal? Because that's really, really common in these animals too. Was there some other kind of tumor infection and stuff like that? Um, they ended up deciding to relinquish because I had mentioned exploratory celiotomies and they were like, Ugh! <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> um, Calling it Big O just didn't stick with us. So we named it Big OG for Big Orange Goldfish. And it became our clinic Orange Goldfish. And I was like, you know, it'd be fun radiating this thing. And I had a gap in my schedule. And so we anesthetized it again and decided to put it through the CT scan. Um, we had just relatively gotten a new CT scan. And so we were in a phase where we were putting everything through it just for fun, like tarantulas and all kinds of stuff, just like... It's like the will it blend infomercial, but we were like, will it scan? You know, <laughs> like that's how you learn, particularly in exotics where there isn't a ton of education out there. We learned through experimentation. And so I was like, let's do it. Um, so we got this kid in some salt, which just helps with inflammation, antimicrobial effects, um, renal support. And then we switched him to sinking food and he was like a little vacuum cleaner. As soon as I switched him to like non-floating food, he was like, Rrr. it was really cute. Um, Speaking of vacuum cleaners, I have a really fat koi named Electrolux. She's one of my favorites too, because she's, she's massive. Um, but anyway, <laughs> Electrolux isn't in here. <laughs> I just really like her. So this is our fish going through the CT scan. Um, it is upside down. It is completely anesthetized. It was a very stressful couple of minutes, but we did it. Um, so I gave this kid IV contrast because we were trying to track it through the body. And that involved lots of calculations of like how fast did their heart beat and what's the output. And I still was wrong. I tried really hard, but I didn't get it in the right way. <laughs> but again, we learned from experimentation, right? So I gave this kid some IV um, contrast media. And then we did three different scans on this kiddo. And in between, we had it back in its bucket of anesthesia. And amazingly, we did it. The sedation level was adequate enough that this creature was still enough for us to get what's called a helical scan, which means the CT is continuously moving and taking images then. Um, the more detailed scan is what's called axial. So the whole 
apparatus will move and take an image and then move and take an image and then move. And that just takes way longer. And I'm like, we don't have time for that. So we did this like real fast one. Um, and we ended up getting some really good information at least. Um, but this is one of my favorite pictures because I was notorious for just asking my technicians to do really weird stuff like this. And this was my tech today. She's actually at the Brevard Zoo in Florida now, and she's amazing. But she was like, you want me to do what? I'm like, we're going to make this fish sleepy. We're going to shoot it through the CT. It's going to be fine. <laughs> and uh, she still talks about this. And I still do too. I tease her all the time. I say, Letitia, you're still in my talk because your face when I asked you to do that was just my favorite. Um, so this is a sagittal section of the CT. And I know that it kind of just looks like snow, but I'm going to explain to you what we're looking at. So um, this white kind of almost looks like a necklace kind of running midway through our upside down fish is the spinal cord and the vertebrae. And then right above it, we see two kind of half bubbles. So those are the two chambers of the swim bladder. On CT, they should be totally black because gas is black on CT. But what we see is that they're partially and almost fully, in the case of the cranial swim bladder, full of something. Um, so something that looks, it could be soft tissue, but we know that this fish is upside down and we know that fluid moves with gravity, right? So we know that this is fluid. Um, so this kid had a whole bunch of fluid in his swim bladder and we diagnosed it on CT. Not a thing that we would have been ever, ever, ever able to see on ultrasound because the surface of the swim bladder is really refractile and it just, you can't see anything on ultrasound. Even on x-ray, it's questionable how much you can get. And so the fact that we had this with this level of clarity was amazing and a really big deal. Um, so as, as this kid was waking up, I did pneumocystocentesis, which is just a really big word for the fact that I poked a needle in both chambers of the swim bladder, sucked out as much fluid as I could, crossed my fingers that I put enough air back in to make this kid positively buoyant again. And then we sent off the fluid for a culture because we wanted to know what was growing in there. Um, and then in cytology, I just put some on a slide and I... I rely on pathologists to know what they're doing so I can kind of pretend, but basically I was like, Ooh, there's bacteria. right?" Like, <laughs> and we were looking for something called mycobacteriosis, which is really common in fish patients. And we weren't seeing it, which is great news because mycobacteriosis is, is basically terminal in fish. There's nothing that we can do to recover them from this. So the fact that we didn't see that, um, gave us a lot of hope, which is great news. So we were like, okay, cool. We're going to start this kid on antibiotic injections while we wait for culture results, because they take eight years to come back. And then we got our culture results back. The good thing to focus on is that I picked the right antibiotic just by chance. <laughs> uh, so immediately following aspiration, this kid recovered and was positively buoyant again. So it was off the ground, swimming, doing awesome. Was like, oh my God, what happened? Uh, and then within five days after aspiration and starting the antibiotics, uh, we had a complete resolution of symptoms. So we had to do a little bit of like PT, like this kid building those muscles back up because they'd been negatively buoyant for so long. But five days was all it took for this fish to look like a completely normal fish again. And then just for funsies, because it was still in the hospital, we repeated the CT scan one month following the initial scan, and we had no evidence of fluid in either chamber. So on the right side of the screen is the initial scans, and this is the, I believe, cranial swim bladder. And then on the left, we have the one month post scans. So that is a normally shaped full of air swim bladder, which is very exciting. <laughs> And then this is the caudal swim bladder. I like this one because you can see the really distinct fluid line in there. And I just like CTs in general because they look like silly faces. But um, speaking of, this was just another screen grab that I got because CTs always come out with stuff like this. <laughs> this fish is fine. It's just what it looks like. It looks totally terrified. But um, the cool thing is that at the time that I was doing this, this was a new thing that people were just starting to play with. And now it's way more common, which is so, so wonderful. They're actually doing MRIs on fish in water now, which is amazing. Um, and people are doing more contrast and we're just having lots of fun as fish vets with like, will it scan? And we all share weird pictures with each other. So it's pretty great. Um, I've never tried scanning them in water, but apparently it works. So that's on my, my bucket list. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, but definitely I need to up my IV contrast game. I try to take something out of every case that I do. And it's always like a, a look back and like, okay, what can I do better next time? And I think that's just a vet thing, but, um, that was a pretty fun case. And this is a uh, big OG now. So he got rehomed and lives in a gigantic, like indoor pond. It's amazing. And he has a ton of fish buddies and he like rules the whole system and is doing great. You would never know that he ever had any problems and this never recurred. So pretty exciting. So that's big OG. Um, this is the trigger warning where I tell you, if you're eating your lunch, we're going to talk about poop next. So 
That's normal. Give everybody a moment to mute me if they need to. <laughs> uh, but now we're going to talk about uh, an obstipated Pac-Man frog. Um, so this is Monroe. He's a three-year-old Pac-Man frog, and he hadn't pooped in a couple of weeks. Um, his owner was my vet tech, who's just an amazing kind human being and who was so upset that he wasn't doing well. Um, this was one of our will it scan patients. We just put him through the CT too, just like for fun. We're like, let's see what a frog looks like. So he'd been a very good little volunteer. He definitely needed some help. And I was like, bring him on in. We're going to deal with him. But um, with these guys, a lot of times constipation comes from just being like subacutely dehydrated. So I was like, so him. that'll do it. And it didn't work. And then we tried massaging his belly, which went about as well as you can imagine. <laughs> he's basically like a little baseball with a big angry mouth and it just it didn't work um so we were like okay well let's try and figure out what in the world we can do with this kid uh so i put him in a ziploc bag and ultrasounded him <laughs> uh that's what i do for a lot of my patients that would be reactive or uncomfortable with handling for any reason so i will examine them through a ziploc bag i'll give injections through a ziploc bag i'll ultrasound them stuff like that um axolotls particularly do really well in like sandwich size bags but anyway our big concern was, could this be um, accidentally his substrate? Had he eaten too much of his like coconut bark? Could it be a foreign body? Um, was he obstructed for something else? These guys are all mouth. Basically, they're like mouth and tiny little tick legs. And so it's not uncommon for them to eat something they're not supposed to. It's a pretty standard thing for Pac-Man frogs. Um, so we we put everything on, you know, on our list. And when we did an ultrasound, we were looking for fabric, plastic, a tumor and SBI. See, I told you it's an actual thing that veterinary is. So pop quiz, think to yourself, do you remember what SBI means? Something bad inside. So we were just looking for something bad inside. Um, the good thing that we saw here, because he hadn't pooped, my concern was a chronic obstipation can lead to perforation, right? So he could have accidentally ruptured his GI tract for some reason. And then that that's a life or death. Like we're going to have to take you to surgery and this is going to be bad. And Thankfully, we didn't see any excessive fluid in his belly. We didn't see any evidence of like a perforation, but he definitely was really heavily impacted with sparkly material on ultrasound, you know, so that kind of tells me something a little bit about what it is. I didn't see a gas pattern that was letting me know that he was completely obstructed. So that meant that gas could move through a little bit, liquid could move through a little bit. We weren't in as dire straits as we thought we were, but there was definitely something gross in his GI tract and nothing was working to get it out. Um, so this is where uh, learning through experimentation comes back in. So I kind of sat and was brainstorming. I was like, okay, so I can go and I can read my books, right? Because that's, I do that all the time. I'll literally bring a book into an appointment and pull it out and be like, I've never seen this. Let's figure it out together. Um, and then I could also pull the audience, right? So I could ask my staff and my friends, when you can't go to the bathroom, what helps you? Um, and so I'll give everybody a second to think because I think it's probably not going to be that surprising what I chose. Um, but prune juice, do frogs in, 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 ingest prune juice? Prune juice is a good idea. And you're on the right track. You're totally on the right track with ingestion. I did both things. And this answer came up in both of them. Caffeine. Oh, interesting. <laughs> a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, um, so, <laughs> yeah, like, cheers. Um, I <laughs> So caffeine has been demonstrated, right, to cause increased nerve activity and increased bowel contractions. Like this is science. It's not just a like anecdotal. <laughs> it's a universal, actually studied thing. Um, in humans, it's 60% more effective than a glass of water. And caffeine, caffeinated, like coffee or tea, is 23% better than decaf. So caffeine definitely is a huge part of this, right? So it's not just that you're drinking bean juice. It's that you're getting caffeine. Um, so the thought was that it increases the GI tract acidity and then it increases gastrin secretion and then increased digestion and gastric emptying. That's the thought of it. But also does caffeine just make your gut go like this? I don't know. So I'm sitting here and I'm like, all right, well, I don't know what Monroe's Starbucks order is. So how can I get some caffeine in him. And also at this point I was at the clinic, right? I can't just run out and get stuff. I'm like, all right, I got to work with what I have here. How can we make this work? And so I put my staff to like, bring me everything caffeinated that you can find in this hospital, which was a lot, which is a lot because we're veterinarians and vet techs, nobody sleeps. Um, but <laughs> I was brought back this like array of stuff. 
And I was thinking to myself, okay, they have really high skin permeability. So I could probably do this just as a soak. I wouldn't necessarily have to do it as like an orally administered thing, but I have to be careful because things like tea and coffee can be really astringent, really drying, really inflammatory um, for the skin. And they have really crazy pH. And I don't want to torture my patient by putting them in this really like nasty environment just to try and get them to poop. Like it's, it's do no harm. Right. And that, that counts as harm. I don't want to do that. So somebody brought back a bag of green tea. And I was like, ha ha. All right. I think we got it. Um, and then somebody lovingly made me this image to use in this talk when I give it. It was not frog farts. I believe it was Tazo Serenity or something like that. But anyway, shout out to Tazo. I'm not sponsored by them. But anyway, he got a soak. Oh, joy. It was joy. <laughs> So this is my setup. Um, he was only in the coffee mug for a photo op. He did get put in a, a different bin with a lid because the caffeine worked really well. Um, and he got hyper. He he got really boingy and was just like boing and just jumped right out of his little bath and was like hopping across the counter and we had to catch him and put him back in. Um, and we were monitoring his heart rate. And interestingly, we saw it go up, you know, not not out of like a normal physiologic range, but it absolutely was having an effect on him. And then it worked. So <laughs> that's frog poop. Um, <laughs> that is frog poop. And what it is full of is really hard, crunchy chitin because it turns out that his very loving mom had fed him superworms as she thought as a treat. And superworms, if anybody's interacted with them for any reason, um, are incredibly crunchy. I can vouch for that in both an eating way and just like a I've been to bug fest. Everybody's been a super warm at bug fest. <laughs> um, but yeah, right. And so being a Pac-Man frog, he ate until he literally corked himself with crunchy insect shells. And he felt amazingly better, went on to live a very happy life and uh, never got super worms again. But you can even see like little antenna and legs and stuff in there. It was really gross. Um, I hope you all are enjoying your lunch now. <laughs> Uh, so I have just one more case, which it looks like we're going okay on time to like do some questions and stuff at the end. Awesome. Uh, and this one's about an arowana, which are really, really cool, really, really cool patients, but not good pets. Uh, this is Sparkles. <laughs> Sparkles uh, lives in a 250 gallon aquarium in the lobby of a doctor's office. This is, I'll tell you right away, spoiler alert, this is too small of a tank for a fish this size. This is a huge, huge fish. Um, these guys like living in um, warm kind of low pH water. So you have to be really careful about that. The water quality was okay. Actually, this was a case of a person who knew enough of their natural history to be trying to replicate that pretty well. And they had a sail fin placlostomus in there, which um, likes that kind of environment too. So that was okay. I always ask if you added anything into the system, because whenever anybody gets sick, it's usually like a new creature came in and brought with it all of its, its own nasty bacteria and parasites and stuff. But that wasn't the case here. Um, Sparkles' big complaint was something called drop eye. So about one to two months ago, the owner noticed that Sparkles' eye was kind of drooped down like this and couldn't lift it up. And so we call that ventral strabismus, but it's it's just drop eye. Um, and because of the drop eye, the patient wasn't able to eat. It seemed like they were having a really hard time time moving towards the prey items and actually catching them and ingesting them. Um, this kid was fed frozen and thawed bait fish and silver sides, which isn't varied enough in my opinion, but that's, that's a talk for another day. <laughs> so I had some limitations on this exam, which was that this patient was in South Carolina and I'm not licensed in South Carolina. So I could not drive down there and just see this patient. Um, but with large predatory fish in general, because I do see large predatory and venomous fish in my practice and poisonous fish, um, there are a lot of risks. You have to be really careful. It's just like working with any other kind of venomous or poisonous animal. So there's always a risk to trauma and injury to the patient during the exam. These guys are incredibly, incredibly strong and they're all muscle. Um, so spinal fractures are not out of the realm of possibility when it comes to working with them. And then there's also trauma and injury risk to me, which I'm way less concerned about myself than I am about my patient, but I don't, I would really like to keep all of my fingers so I can keep doing surgery. So it's a risk, right? Um, and the other thing is that arowana are actually illegal in many states. Part of that goes down to the way that they are, you know, live caught, taken out of the environment, but also they're, they're dangerous animals, you know? So this was a concern and this owner was kind of like, I mean, they had it in the lobby of their doctor's office, but they were like, oh, you can get me in trouble. And I'm like, 
man, I'm not going to do that. So telehealth it was. Um, and that was really interesting. But we did do some telehealth for this fish. This is an example of what we saw. So this is what drop eye looks like. And you can tell some interesting things about this fish and its natural history just from this picture. So what we have is a really large mouth that's oriented um, almost completely vertically, right? And it's pointed up at the surface. So these guys are surface feeders. Um, and they catch all of their fish from up. So normally their eyes are oriented up like this so they can see what's swimming around up above them and they can kind of come under it and get it in and eat. Um, this kid had ventral strabismus in both eyes, but just anecdotally, it looked like the right eye was worse than the left. This is a fat fish because it was not being fed the right way. But the good thing was, was that it wasn't, it, we weren't seeing any signs of trauma or anything. These guys have, you know, bony orbits. This is a bony fish. And so they can get fractures around their eyes, just like anybody else can. And I was worried that that may have been part of the issue. The environment was small, but um, they, they were doing okay. With arowana, you want to make sure that there's substrate on the bottom. So there's something, obviously not something that they can get in their mouths, but the reflection could be causing them to look down more than up. And so that would have been really confusing for this guy. And they had that. The lid was secured and weighted. You would be amazed how many people with these large, <laughs> strong fish don't have a lid. And then they call me and they're like, it jumped out. I'm like, okay, <laughs> did you get it back in? And then let's deal with it from there. But thankfully this lid was not only secured, but it was weighted and the water quality was appropriate for the species. So we were eliminating a lot of that stuff. I really like eyeballs. So I want to talk about them for just a second. Again, grossing everybody out right now. Um, but this is like a, a kind of standard fish eyeball. The cool thing to note about them is that their lenses are perfectly circular, which helps kind of change the refraction angle. Because if you think about it, water messes with refraction angles anyway. And so having a perfectly circular lens instead of like more of a disc shaped one like we do actually really accommodates for that, which is, is pretty neat stuff. Um, there's lots of really weird adaptations that fish have, not just kind of a vertically oriented eye. They have all kinds of crazy things like yellow corneal pigmentation, which you can see, which kind of helps reflect light back in a normal way. They have a really strong dazzle response, which is just a fancy word for like shining a bright light in their eyes. They don't have eyelids, right? So if somebody shines a bright lid, bright light in your eyes, you're going to blink and be like, Ugh. but for large fish like grouper and things in an aquarium, that's actually one of the ways that they safely restrain them initially or how they safely move them into an area where they can take care of them. They strobe them. And that's just enough to kind of, bleh, and they can move them somewhere safely without anybody getting hurt. So it's interesting how we can use some of these like physiologic changes with them. Um, their optic nerves don't really cross over in any way, the way that a lot of mammals do. So if I shine a light in this eye for one of us or a dog or a cat, this eye will respond the same way. But if I do it in a fish, it won't, they don't speak to each other. Um, and they have this little space where the lens isn't in their eyes, which is neat. And they have a curved iris. So just um, fun stuff. But you can see kind of how that difference down on the bottom, how it kind of changes the way light refracts back into the retina and just accommodates for water um, issues. But they also have weird things like eyes rotated upwards, like the case of our arowana. They have really large lenses um, and some of these guys that are kind of in the mesoplagic zone. So kind of middle to upper. And then they're super deep fish. Um, usually have small non-functioning or completely absent eyes because they don't need them. Like, what's the point? Um, flatfish, very interestingly, which you can see flatfish at the museum, start out in their larval form, swimming normally like a regular fish with eyes on each side of their head. And then they end up deciding, are they righty or lefty? And their eye actually migrates all the way over their skull to the other side. And then when they're on one side, they have two eyes. Um, so that's really fun, I guess. I'm really showing my nerd real hard right now. Um, but I always thought that was fascinating. <laughs> and then there are four eyed fish. So this fish um, that I'm showing right at the bottom has two separate irises that lead to the same retina. And one set is meant to look below the water level and one's meant to look above the water level. So they kind of swim with their heads right at the water level and they can see above and below. Pretty cool. Anyway, back to arowana. Um, so arowana are a nightmare in captivity. They're not, they're not good pets. We see lots of issues with them. They get lots of musculoskeletal disease. Um, so they're either fat or way too thin. They have easily broken bones, uh, just generally kind of not, not thriving. They jump out of tank, they bang into the tank, they attack everyone and everything. They're little stress balls. And in the wild, I mean, this is an arowana, they can get three meters off the surface of the water. They can really go. And so when we're keeping them in a little tank and we can't do that for them, they get overweight, they get muscle atrophy, they get nastiness. Um, and they just, we don't 
we don't replicate their diet the right way, which is a big problem for me with a lot of my patients. And they do get dropped by. This is a common reported thing. So for this particular case, I used a very high tech solution of ping pong balls. <laughs> So what was going on is that it's likely that this fish was overweight and had fatty deposits in his orbit that was pushing his eye downward, but also wasn't being fed appropriately and had too many things that were drawing his vision down. And so those ligaments started to stretch and he wasn't able to keep his eyes in the normal position. So I wanted them to vary the diet and reduce the fat content, doing things like insects, snails, beef heart, earthworms, crustaceans, a more natural diet that we would see for this Amazonian river fish, which basically is just going to eat everything. And then, um, so we're doing eyeball PT by putting in ping pong balls. <laughs> and I told my client, I was like, you can literally even draw faces and patterns on them if you want. But what we're trying to do is episodes of exercising those extra ocular muscles so the fish looks up again. And then hopefully that will start to correct it. Um, and then, you know, the balls need to be big enough that the fish won't eat them because they might. So things like styrofoam floats um, that you can actually suspend food from or using um, like fishing bobbers works too. But basically we're just trying to give this fish a workout to start looking up again. And then I wanted them to rehome the pleco too, just because there was way too much fish in that system. And the arowana was probably watching the pleco the whole time, which wasn't helping things. The fish needed a bigger tank. It needed more, you know, um, exercise. And then we talked briefly about doing surgical management. So this client was actually a pediatric ophthalmologist. And so that's why they were so upset that their fish had strabismus because it was in their lobby of a pediatric ophthalmologist. And the doctor was like, well, can I just do surgery? Can you come and do anesthesia? And I'm like, mm -mm. <laughs> I'm out. I can't do that. <laughs> I like having my license. I'm not going to do that. But she and I had a really interesting conversation about potentially pursuing something like this together in the future, because that's how they correct strabismus in kids. So they actually do surgery on the muscles that are around there. And we were like, well, maybe one day, but I never got to do it. Uh, so basically the moral of this story is that arowana are not good pets. They're really, really bad pets, but uh, this is really common. And then in about one to two months, we got a little bit of improvement. Uh, it's hard to say whether it was PT or it was not being so chubby, but this is one of those things that is unsightly, but not life-threatening. So interesting to learn about, but not too much. So that's the breakneck pace of what it's like to be an aquatics veterinarian. But I wanted to make sure that I just ended because I know that a lot of this is targeted towards um, educators, environmental educators and interpreters and things. And um, these are my three little guys. And I just wanted to say thank you for what you guys do, because I see the impact that passionate educators have on my kids already as young as they are. So their teachers, their interpreters, curators that we've met, all that kind of stuff. So um, just thank you for what you guys do and encouraging little people like my little people. Um, so that's Nora, Max, and Finn, because I can't be an aquatics vet without a kid with a, like a fish pun for a name. It's nice. <laughs> uh, but yes, thank you very much to everybody. Thank you guys for having me. And um, I'm very happy to take questions. I can be contacted through my website if needed. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. That was amazing. <laughs> oh, <And gosh. laughs> I, I mean, just watching you, I know that you are also an inspiration to your kids and the other kids that I'm sure you interact with because just the like passion and like stick to itiveness that you, you demonstrate in being where you are. Um, and just the creativity. I was just thinking about like, what a fun job you get to like, figure out how to give PT to fish eyeballs with ping pong balls. Like that's amazingly clever. Thank you. It is, it is a super fun job. I think every day how incredibly lucky I am to get to do this. And my kids think I'm super boring and lame. So <laughs> they'll come around as they get older. You never know. <laughs> um, uh, we're getting a lot of good feedback in the chat now too. Um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and um, stop or st why don't you stop sharing your screen so yeah, they can right. see your face again a little bit more um but yeah lots of um really nice comments in fact you got at the, early on a comment from um bentley richards at the north <laughs> pole and <just laughs> riley that um we're giving you some major props for being awesome and i think they're right <laughs> that's a total personal bias those are two of my best friends from vet school <laughs> oh that's awesome that's cool that they tuned in from from the north pole that's amazing all the way from the north pole yeah <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'm going to take a look for um, some questions in there. I know I saw at least one. Um, oh, and somebody said they remember treating Monroe with green tea, which that is just amazingly clever too. <laughs> I that's, that's seriously one of my favorite cases. So I bring it all the time whenever some, so, so there's probably somebody out there who's like, ugh, 
<laughs> talk again, the same poop picture. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be a good museum talk without some animal poop picture, right? So, um, but okay, I have a question to get us started. And then I know I saw at least one other in the chat that I want to get to, but um, I want to know how you know if a fish is itchy. Oh. <laughs> Good question. So they do something called flashing, um, which you have to figure out why they're flashing, right? Because sometimes they're itchy, sometimes they're just being squirrely or having fun or chasing each other or doing something. Um, but it's this really erratic, fast movement that looks really atypical. So they'll swim at something too. And they'll kind of, if they're oriented, so if this is their little like dorsal fin, right? They're swimming like this. And then all of a sudden they'll switch how they're oriented and they'll kind of like scoot up against something. It literally looks like they're scratching themselves. Um, and then often when they do that enough, they'll have like superficial ulcers or redness. They'll just look really gross. Uh, they'll be chasing other fish around because they're grumpy, like, you know, just generally acting like jerks. But the flashing thing is the big one. Interesting. That, that, that I would not have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a question from Kim Sue who asked, how do you sedate a fish? And then how long can they stay out of the water without <laughs> dying? Yeah. So um, I mentioned two of the things that are most commonly used. So MS-222 is what I use. It's a chemical anesthetic. And the really cool thing about it is that it comes dried and powdered. So we put it in the water doing math to get to the right concentration. And we know there's lots of studies that vary based on species of fish and water temperature and yada, yada, but we know general ranges. And so we put it in there. And then what happens is it dissolves and gets taken up in their gills the same way that an inhaled anesthetic would get taken up in our lungs for us, because the gills are very, very similar to lungs. What we go is we go all the way down to the level of a single capillary. So one red blood cell at a time moving through it. And that gives enough exposure to the outside environment that we can get this countercurrent circulation. Right. So things move across a gradient by osmosis and <laughs> there isn't a lot of anesthesia in the fish. So the anesthesia goes into the fish. And then when we put them back in fresh water, that anesthesia moves out of their bloodstream into the regular water. And you have to be careful to not reanesthetize them. But that's how we recover them just in regular water. Um, and then they can be, you know, it varies by fish. Um, they can be out of the water for a couple minutes and be just fine. We do. <laughs> what I call basting them. <laughs> so we do like spray them off with water, but I do surgery on fish completely out of water. Um, when I'm maintaining them for surgery, what I do is I take the anesthetized water and I use a small aquarium pump attached to a hose and I feed it into their mouth and we position it in a way that it runs out and over both of their gills. So their bodies are out of water and I can do surgically um, everything that I need to do, but it's like, they're still breathing underwater. So Oh, wow. I never would have thought you could do that to a fish. That's, that's like a reverse scuba. Yeah. <laughs> or like when you're trying to test your motorboat engine in a garbage can. Um. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Only I shoved that pipe in their mouth. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> but yeah, the first time anybody sees that, it totally blows their mind. And then they're like, wow, that's, that's really straightforward. <laughs> like it really is. It sounds kind of magical, but it's just an aquarium pump I got on Amazon. <laughs> Hey, we're doing a lot with a little. That's great. <laughs> That's a skill too. Um, so um, I had another question too. I was wondering, you you hinted at this earlier that you use bubble wrap in surgery <laughs> and you have a favorite piece of bubble wrap. I, feel like <laughs> I do. <laughs> one specific piece that I love. Um, and it's weird. It's all vets are like that. We have like one specific instrument that we're very attached to that we get really upset if anybody else touches. And I do have one piece of bubble wrap that I like. It's got just the right size bubbles. Um, but I use it as a liner for my um, my surgical setup. And then also when I have them out. So I do surgery in a couple different ways, like in a V-shaped trough with foam kind of supporting them, or I'll do it with them just kind of laying on their sides. And then I always line whatever I need to have them on with that bubble wrap because we're providing a little bit of body support, right? They're not going to get pressure sores or anything like that, but it also provides a little bit of insulation and uh, it keeps them from flying all over the place. <laughs> so we get a little bit of grip without shredding their mucus coat. <laughs> um, and I don't mind if it gets wet, I can disinfect it really easily. Uh, it's just generally like a really nice all purpose, <laughs> but I do have one specific piece of bubble wrap. I love. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Don't pop the bubbles ever, right? No, no, no. Oh my God. It can't go anywhere near my kids because they're like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. No, please leave this one alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I could replace this, just bubble wrap, but um, I'm already weird enough, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, a couple other questions have popped up. Um, I think Kim Sue also asked that if her sister-in-law has a fish that's sick, can she contact you? Um, I think that was on your last slide, but if you want, I can drop it um, into the chat for you. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's oakcityaquaticsvet.com. Um, and I have a contact through there. Uh, if you call the number, it my practice is just me. <laughs> like, I don't have a receptionist or a tech or anything. So if you call the number, you're going to get me. Um, but I do telehealth within, you know, certain ex like rules about different states, but I can also always point somebody in the right direction to find a vet in their state. If they're out of the state, um, the fishvets.org website is the American association of fish veterinarians. And it's like our big nerdy professional organization. Um, and we have a fish vet locator on there. So you can put in your address and find a fish vet near you, but I'm always happy to point people towards it too. Awesome. Um, and then Marty asked, what's the strangest or most remote location you've gone to in order to treat a pa patient? Mm, okay. I got to think about that because there's <laughs> definitely been some weird ones. Um, you know, <laughs> I got to say that the library was one of the most terrifying for sure. <laughs> She it said there were children there watching you do surgery. Oh my God. And you know, I don't want to like, I don't want to discourage anybody, but also like I was literally doing surgery and I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't answer your questions right now. I will answer them, but my small brain can only do so much at once. And I need to make sure this patient stays alive first. Um, so that was probably the most stressful one. Um, but you know, people with koi ponds live in all kinds of places. And I see everything from like these huge, gigantic mansions to just like these cute little tubs in the backyard. And my favorite is always the clients who are like, we bought this house. They told us they were going to take the fish and they didn't. And now we have fish. And we don't know what to do. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm here. I can help. Um, so, you know, not, not too much craziness, but. Yeah. <laughs> and Favorite weird CT scan. Ooh, okay. So the tarantula was really fun, right? Because they have exoskeletons. They have exoskeletons. So when we're moving through the 3D render, it mm. like looks really cool. It looks like a perfect little 3D tarantula. And then you move past the outer exoskeleton and it's just black. Like there's just nothing. And we were like, well, that was totally useless. But now we know. <laughs> um, and then the other one that I had was, um, I had like an almost 10, no, maybe like a seven foot Burmese Python that would just not anesthetize. It just would not anesthetize. It was just being a grump. And so I ended up having to go in there while the CT was running, which is really dangerous. You're not supposed to do that. And I was just covered all as much lead as I could possibly be on to try and protect myself. But one of the vets that I worked with at that clinic is a holistic vet who does acupuncture, acupressure, um, herbs and stuff like that. And we'd already given this snake like so many drugs. It just no more drugs for the snake. Right. So she comes in and she shows me this acupressure point and she's like, just keep pressing here. And hopefully it stays still long enough for us to get an image. Mm -hmm. And so I was in there and the snake was so long that we had two surgical tables end to end, just trying to support its body. In addition to the gantry that comes out of the CT. And I was just sitting there like pressing this and hoping the snake didn't wake up and like try to kill me before the CT finished and it ended up working, but that was probably one of the crazier ones. That yeah, sounds like it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I really appreciate this comment that just came in from Erica Young with C Grant. Knowing how to make a backed up frog poop is hands down the best thing I've learned this week. You are welcome. Tea, green <laughs> tea, not black tea. <laughs> I think that I think that just sums it up, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, we'll be back next week at noon on Wednesday with our next um, Women's History Month uh, speaker. And Marty shared in the chat who that's going to be, but it's Alyssa Rafa, meteorologist and climate specialist at Queen City News and Fox Charlotte, who's also working at Discovery Place um, in Charlotte. So join us next week at noon for the next Lunchtime Discovery Series. And thank you from the Museum of Natural Sciences and the Office of Environmental Education and Public Affairs. Thank you.